If you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, we're going to pick back up where we left off last week. Try to continue the thoughts to bring us to the understanding of the one blood bought church. If you would, let's bow and have a word of prayer as we begin our class this morning. Father, we're thankful for another day. We're thankful that you have blessed us in so many ways. We pray, Father, that in, in all these blessings, we will give thee thanks, recognize what you've done for us. Help us be mindful of the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, his love and willingness to come and sacrifice himself upon the cross to shed his blood that we might have hope of life eternal. We're thankful, Father, for your considering us and your planning and for you being with us every day and watching over us. And we pray, Father, that we will in turn live our lives in complete obedience to thy will. That in doing the things that we do and the things that we say, we might bring honor and glory to you and your son. We pray, Father, you bless us today as we study. Help us to understand the things that are in the scriptures. Help us to grow in our knowledge of the truth and to be able to give an answer of the hope that lies within us. As we gather together this morning, we're mindful of many who are unable to be with us, who desire to have their health to be in a much better state. And we pray that you'll bless them and those who are administering to them that they might be able to recover and be back with us. We're also mindful of those who've lost loved ones and we pray that they would continually have comfort and we might be mindful of them in the, the days and weeks and months ahead. Help us, Father, to love one another. Help us to love the truth. Help us to love you and your son and demonstrate that in our lives. We pray, Father, that as we strive to do thy will that you will be mindful of us as, as weak human beings and we recognize that we fall short many times of what we should, should say and do and we pray that you'll bless us and forgive us of those sins that we have a mess in our lives. We pray that we'll repent of those things and to strive to be better servants. We pray for those who are teaching the world over the truth. We pray that they might have strength and courage to continue. We pray for those who, who live in the world that they might have uh, some means of having their eyes opened or their hearts open that they might be able to hear the truth. We pray, Father, you continue to bless us as we endeavor to do the things at this location that would spread, help to spread the borders of the kingdom. Continue with us in the days ahead. Watch over and care for us. And uh, one day, Father, we pray that you'll let us hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, let's go back just a little bit and uh, sort of review the things we talked about. We started out in Ephesians chapter 1, looking at God preparing for us predetermining that we would have the opportunity to be in Christ, to be uh, those who have an inheritance, that we might receive adoptions of sons, and that he did this before the foundations of the world. So when we start to look at the scriptures, we start to understand how it totally unfolds for us. And this is where we have to develop a knowledge of the scriptures and an understanding. Uh, because if we, if we just were to pick up the Bible and start looking at something and not knowing the history that got us there um, and all that went into it, it's a little difficult sometimes for people to just pick up on that and, and know what's going on. So 
That's part of what we want to understand here as we talk about the one blood-bought church. And uh, we want to try to do the best to look at Scripture and to uh, zero in on, on that uh, activity of the coming of the church and to have a, a complete understanding of it because there's so much um, misunderstanding in the world today. So we talked about God laying the foundation um, before the worlds begin of what his plan would be. We went back and we looked at some prophecy. We looked at prophecy saying that uh, the church would be established in Jerusalem, come out of Jerusalem. And uh, Isaiah chapter 2, about verses 1 through 5. And we talked about in that process how that that there would be a walking in verse 5 of Isaiah chapter 2, a walking in the light. And that's significant because um, we're going to see that kind of terminology talked about quite extensively in the New Testament. We'll touch on some of those things. And then when we, we continue to look at prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44 where the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has that was being interpreted by Daniel uh, led to the uh, understanding of God establishing uh, a, a, um, a kingdom in the days of the kings of the Romans that would never be destroyed. And if you notice, when we looked at that passage, we talked about this stone that was going to exist that was cut without hands. And this stone crushed the feet of the, the uh, image that was part of the uh, the dream, the, uh, the feet of clay and iron, and it, it shattered that. And so we begin to see some significance here. We're talking about a rock, a great stone that God has established that is going to be involved in crushing the, the Roman Empire. Now, physically, it was not a battle of armies. It was not a battle of uh, physical kingdoms, but it was a battle of God and his kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, uh, against an earthly kingdom in, in that sense, in that understanding. And so we tried to establish all that. So then we got, worked our way to, um, uh, to Matthew chapter 16, and that's where we were talking about Jesus comes to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and he says, he asked his, his disciples, whom do men say that I am? And some said, well, you're John the Baptist. Some said, you're Elias or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And, and then he asked the question, well, who, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter spoke up and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, that is, Simon, son of Jonah, uh, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And so Jesus continues his, his thinking and his, his thoughts and his discussion now as we pick up uh, in verse 18. And Jesus is talking and he says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We will look at that in a little bit more detail because it's better uh, for us to have a complete understanding of this verse to help to understand um, the truth and to be able to uh, refute some religious teachings. Um, for example, um, there are people today who believe, who teach, that the church was built upon Peter. And the, the Catholic Church will say that Peter was the first pope. Okay, so that's something that we all have to, to address and understand. This verse is, is critical to understanding some of that. Now, when you start looking at the, the Greek that's associated with this verse, we need to break it down. Jesus is saying unto him, Thou art Peter. Okay, the Greek word there is Petros. 
Thou art Peter, Petros. Petros means a stone, a small stone, one that you could pick up in your hands. Okay? The word that's used here is masculine in gender. So it's important for us to know this verse and the understanding of this verse so that we can talk to people about the confusion that people have as Peter being the first pope or, or, or the church being built upon Peter. We need to understand this. Thou art Petros, a stone, a small stone. And upon this rock, Petra, which means a ledge of rock, something that is big, something that you could build upon. If you look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, we know this story well because we've sung it from our youth. The wise man built his house upon the rock, Petra. And so when we look at this, we have to understand the distinction of what Jesus is saying. Um, you see in other passages where uh, Jesus is talking about Peter, when, G when uh, uh, Andrew uh, is going to introduce um, Peter to Jesus, uh, he talks about him uh, and, and says in that passage that Peter, which by interpretation is a stone. So the Bible itself gives us that, that understanding. So here we have Peter, a stone, and we have Petra, a rock, a ledge of rock, something that's solid that could be, something could be built upon. Now, keep this in mind as you understand some of these things. What did we talk about that would crush the Roman Empire in Daniel 2? This rock that was made without hands, that was cut out without hands, okay? So we need to understand this. Um, so he's saying that you're Peter, a stone, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church. Now, there's some confusion among scholars about what this means. Is it the confession that Peter made? Or is the fact of who Christ is? Well, we could argue that. But the point is, it doesn't really matter because whether it's the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that truth, or the fact of who Christ is uh, just being the Son of God, being the rock, that uh, Him being the rock or the confession, the truth being the, 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 the foundation upon which the church is built. Either way, Christ is the center point. He's the focal point of that happening. And so he says, you're Peter, a stone, and upon this rock, this, this ledge, this, this big rock, this firm foundation, he said, I will build my church. And so we need to understand, first of all, that Jesus built which church? His church. He built his church. Okay, so there's the possession of uh, nature of this particular discussion. I will build my church. Notice he said, I will build it. It's not in existence yet. And so it's key for us to understand that, okay? Because we're going to look at some other passages that lead us into understanding the timing and things involved in that. But I will, future tense, build my church. It is my church. Now the word church here is from a Greek word, Ecclesia, which means called out. Now you could use that terminology to talk about any assembly. Uh, assembling of people called out for an assembly for, for some purpose. But what makes this distinctive is the fact that Jesus is saying this is my called out. And so we need to understand that there's a distinction there. My called out. And and there are other passages that tell us whom Jesus has called, he has also, what? Somebody quote that. He's also sanctified. Okay, he's set apart and made it unique. And uh, so we, we see that, that terminology used. So Jesus says upon this 
solid foundation. Uh, you can argue whether it's the confession that he's the Christ or the fact that he is Christ, and it's built upon him. The um, writer of Peter says that there is a foundation that's built upon that is um, of interest. He's the chief cornerstone. We'll look at that in just a minute. That's in, in 1 Peter. But we'll look at that in just a minute. I want to look at some other things first. But keep this in mind. Jesus said upon this solid truth that Jesus is the Son of God, that foundation, he says, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, the power of hell, cannot prevail against it. Um, Satan is powerful. We can talk about that. and We can go into great detail on that. But suffice it to say, that whatever the power is that Satan has, and most of the, the fear and the, the dread and the power that Satan has revolves around death, and the gates of hell, the power of hell, cannot prevail against the kingdom or the church that Jesus is going to establish. Now, it's interesting when we look into it that he's telling us ahead of time that Peter is going to have the keys to the kingdom. When we look at keys, we think about the, the authorization or the, the power to open, open something up. If, if you have keys to the building, you have the ability to open the doors and come in. And so Peter is going to be involved in the keys or the entrance into the kingdom. That's significant, too, as we look, we'll look a little bit ahead. And uh, he will help define uh, the entrance criteria for the kingdom. And what's supposed to be part of the kingdom. Those kind of things will be discussed. All these are interesting things because they're happening in, in this sense, in a small way, Jesus prophesying himself of things that are going to happen. And so they haven't happened yet. So that's interesting. But I want you to understand this particular passage. He did not build the church upon Peter because Peter is Petros, a small stone. He built the church upon a rock a solid foundation, Petra. And we need to understand the difference there. Now, this is not something that is, uh, should take us by surprise. Let's go back to Isaiah uh, chapter 8 and look at a passage here. In talking about some of the judgments of the people and the way they were <clears throat> in some uh, discussion of not uh, these people not be willing to listen to God, uh, he's talking here of what he shall provide, um, how that they should fear the Lord, verse 13. Sanctify the Lord. Um, <clears throat> of host himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. You recognize the, the terror of the Lord, the power of the Lord. But look at uh, verse 14. He shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense, to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of, what does it say? Jerusalem. Jesus is going to build church on a firm foundation, a rock, a principle, a truth we cannot change or get around. He is the Son of God. And this house, uh, this stumbling, this rock is going to be offensive to the Jews. It's going to be in Jerusalem. And that's significant. We need to understand that. Um, this particular rock is also talked about in, in uh, Romans chapter 9 and verse 33. Let's look at that just real quickly. Where Paul's talking about... <clears throat> the problems that they had uh, under the law of Moses because they were trying to achieve what they should, were trying to achieve the righteousness that they wanted uh, to achieve. They were trying to do it by works. 
And he says they couldn't accomplish it. Um, and, he, and it says, you know, why can they not accomplish it? Um, verse 32, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, behold, I lay in Zion. And we talked about in the very beginning in Isaiah chapter 2 where the church would, would come out of. It would come out of Mount Zion, Jerusalem. And so he's laid this stone in Zion, a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So there's going to be this rock which is going to be offensive to a lot of people. But at the same token, it's also a, a rock that can be built upon, a rock that can be a refuge. And uh, we talk about that in some of our songs. Let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2. And look at what Peter has to say that is similar here. We, we're familiar somewhat with this passage. First Peter 2, let's start with verse 5. You also are, are living stones, uh, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to, to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is, is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded or put to shame. Unto you, therefore, who, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which are, be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. A, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which, uh, at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, uh, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We've already talked about that. We have been called by Jesus Christ. Come out from among them. You be my assembly. And he says, I'll sanctify you and you will be someone who walks in marvelous light. And we'll look at that a little bit later as we look back at... Uh, the uh, passages in Colossians chapter 1. Okay, so we established Jesus is going to build his church. It's going to be on a very firm foundation. We know it's going to be in Jerusalem. Let's look at Acts chapter 1 real quick and continue some of the, the thoughts that have already been discussed in some of the other passages. Let's look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, this is Jesus being assembled together with his, uh, his disciples, uh, specifically here the apostles plus possibly some others, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Why is that significant? Because that's where the church is going to be established. And so we see the church being talked about. We're going to see it, it, the fulfillment of it here in just uh, a few minutes as we look at some other passages. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Let's skip on down a little bit. Verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, without this time restore the kingdom to Israel. And he said, it's not for, for you to know uh, the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and to Samaria and into the other most parts of the earth. Where is it going to begin? Jerusalem. Where is it going to go out from? Jerusalem. Going to Judea, Samaria, to the other most parts of the earth. Now that's still talking about the kingdom of God coming with power in the future. Hasn't happened yet. When's it going to come? The Father will reveal it to you. 
and you'll receive power at some point when he has determined it's time for this to happen. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2, they were assembled on the day of Pentecost. They were all come together with one accord. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. We know as Peter and the rest of the apostles stand up and, and teach and preach, uh, as you go through Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter gets to the point where these men in Jerusalem were convicted when he told them that they had crucified the Son of God. So we have Jesus talking about the church in the future. Hadn't happened yet. We have Jesus talking to his um, apostles after his resurrection from the dead. In Acts chapter 1, the, the kingdom, the church has still not been established yet. In Acts chapter 2, we begin to see things happen. Now, we talked about um, uh, some of the passages last week. We mentioned the idea of the last days. In the last days, God's going to set up the church or establish his ways in Zion, in Jerusalem. And then we talked about this a little bit, that in Acts chapter 2, the the writer says there by inspiration, this is that, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and them being able to speak and teach. This is that which was prophesied by Joel in the last days. I'll do these things. So we're now understanding we're in the last days. And as Peter and the apostles preached to the people there in Jerusalem, and, and they recognize they've crucified the Son of God, and they, they repent of that, what can we do? What can we, what can we do? This, that, you know, God's wrath won't be upon us, that we've done this terrible thing. And Peter tells them to repent and be baptized. And so we see the things as we go through Acts that Peter um, is, is opening up, as we talked about, just demonstrating the keys to the kingdom. Not only did Peter provide the, the keys of the kingdom to the, to the Jewish population in, in Acts chapter 2, but who is the one who tells the first Gentile convert who needs to be the, meet the criteria for entering the kingdom? Peter. And so it, it, this, it's uh, an understandable thing that this is the way it would, would play out. Now, when they recognized what they'd done and Peter told them they could repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins, they did that. And then we look down in verse uh, 47, um, talking about the, the people's uh, rejoicing, their, their excitement of, of uh, becoming obedient. Um, verse 41, they were gladly baptized. They're praising God, verse 47, and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church. Now, you can't add something to something, okay? If you have, I don't know, you can make it simple. If you are following a recipe and you've put flour in a bowl, and now it says to add eggs to the flour, we understand that, right? The flour is existing in the bowl. Well, you can't add people to the church if the church is not in existence. And so we see here the church being, the word church being used for the second time in the New Testament. Uh, and people being able to be added to it. Okay? And so the church has been established. The day of Pentecost. Now, at some point in summary, we want to talk about a number of things that help to distinguish this one blood-bought one blood institution. And we'll, I'll try my best not to forget to do that, but we're going to try to do that as we sort of wrap up. But here we see the church in existence. Now, which church is it? It's the church that Jesus died for. It's the church that Jesus built. It's his church. And I want people to understand that 
Um, because we do this. We do this in the world today and in conversations. Uh, people make this misassumption. When you say the church of Christ, you're not saying I'm a, in, identifying myself as a group over here that's just another group that supposedly claims to follow Jesus Christ. Brother N.B. Hardiman, and I, it's sad to say a lot of you would not know who Brother N.B. Hardiman is. But you know Freed Hardiman, right? <clears throat> well, Freed and Hardiman made up Freed Hardiman University. So Hardiman was a very <clears throat> well-known preacher years and years ago. Brother N.B. Hardiman some was asked one time, what church are you a member of? And Brother Hardiman said, I am a member of the body of Christ. And you know what he, reason he said that? He said because I've never had anybody ask me which body. Which body of Christ are you? And so we need to understand <clears throat> that the church that Jesus built, the church of Christ, the church that belongs to Christ, is not a title. We've got to understand that. It is not a title. It's descriptive of who the church belongs to. We are members of the body of Christ. We're going to look in Ephesians chapter 4, as time permits, to talk about one body. But understand that. That's not a title. And we don't need to use it in that terminology. The best response, if someone asks you, is to give the response that you are a member of the body of Christ. But we know how the world is and how they think. And sometimes within the church, we have no clue. There are people, folks, <clears throat> who believe that the church of Christ that are within the body of Christ is just another denomination. And that is shockingly sad. But there are people who just don't know any better. And we should know better. It's shame on us when we don't know any better. Jesus said, I'll build my church. He says it'll be in Jerusalem. The prophecies prophesied of that. He said, Peter will have the keys to the kingdom. He'll open the doors. And Peter opened the doors on the day of Pentecost and opened the doors in Acts chapter 10 for Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. And we see here in Acts chapter 2 that the Lord was adding to the church those who were being saved. So, let's keep that in mind. Okay, let's look over to um, Ephesians chapter 1 again. And just sort of close the loop and understand some things that tie back into what we'd already started out with. When we finish this lesson, we will have in no means exhausted all the discussion that could take place. But we have to try to fit it within a certain time frame, and uh, we'll leave so much scripture out, but there will be uh, at least an understanding of hopefully things that have put this into place. And I hope some of these words come out and really have great meaning to you after we've discussed the prophecies, not only in the Old Testament, but what Christ had to say. And then looking back um, at, at the church and the establishment of the church. All right, Ephesians chapter 1. Remember where we began God has blessed us, verse 3, in all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. All the blessings that are going to come from God are coming to those who are in Christ. How do we get into Christ? 
Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's how we get into Christ. By obedience, submission, willingness for us to go through that um, process of becoming uh, born again. Remember what he told, told Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3? Unless you enter, unless you're born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so the question was, well, could Nicodemus says, well, um, do I enter my mother's womb a second time How, and be born? How does that happen? I mean, that, that sounds crazy to me. And Jesus said, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, talking about the washing and the changing that would take place according to the scripture. Uh, Titus chapter 2, I believe it is, talks about the regeneration that takes place. We're born again. And uh, we understand that process. We'll talk, try to touch on that some more a little bit further down the road too here and tying all this stuff together. But the blessings that are going to come are going to be in Christ. And he has chosen us in him before the foundations of the world. Having predetermined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Christ is in the middle of what's happening. We cannot be received unto the Father directly. And that's interesting. You know, we, we have people today that probably believe that, uh, you know, uh, if once I've whatever, done whatever I, ha I, I need to do, I just have a direct access to God. We have adoption through Jesus Christ. We have, uh, are able to present ourselves to, to God through Jesus Christ. You cannot get him out of the picture. And so he's made that possible. He's accepted us um, in the beloved, verse 6. In whom we have redemption... How do we have redemption? Through his blood. The, the way that Jesus was able to present us acceptable unto God is because he paid the price. Acts chapter 2, in verse 28, as Jesus talks to the Ephesian elders at Miletus, and he's headed to Jerusalem, he says, I'm not going to be coming back to see you anymore. And it's a sad occasion. He tells them to watch over the flock. Acts 20, 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves, to all the flock, which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God. What does it say there? Which he has purchased with his own blood. We are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. It was necessary for there to be a blood sacrifice. If you look at Old Testament teachings, why do we have animal sacrifices? Because it is going to take a blood sacrifice down the road to be acceptable to God. And it's going to take a perfect, unblemished Lamb, Isaiah talks about that in Isaiah 53. The perfect lamb of God must shed his blood. The Hebrew writer says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And so we needed a sacrifice that would be acceptable to God. Jesus was that sacrifice. He purchased his church. He talks about it in Matthew chapter 16 with his own blood. And we need to understand the significance of that. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. 
that in the dispensation, when is this going to happen? That in the dispensation of when? The fullness of time. The last days. At the appropriate time, when it was full to the point of saying, now we're there. Now it has been accomplished. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, and we've talked about this before, Galatians 4, verse 4. In the fullness of time, when the time was right, God brought forth his son. Born of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. And now we see the dispensation of the fullness of time. He might gather together in one sum all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predetermined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now let's skip down to uh, verse um, 19. And showing forth God um, and, and God what he's done for us. You can read the, the verses in between there. And in showing forth what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us for who believed according to the working of his mighty power. Where did he work that power? Verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. If people were to ask us today a question that's out there, a religious question, where is the headquarters of the Church of Christ? And there again, that's the, the whole title thing that really bothers me because we're not talking about a title, we're talking about an entity. A called out group of people, called out by Jesus Christ. Where's the headquarters of the Church of Christ? It's in heaven. Now, if you go talk to any other religious group on this face of this earth, ask them where their headquarters are, and they'll tell you. They'll tell you. You know where it's going to be? Some location on this earth. And as we look at the one blood-bought church, the one blood-bought body, we really have to look at the scriptures and we have to ask ourselves, what am I a member of? Now, that's the first bell. Um, we'll look at some other things here before it catches us. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4 real quickly. Let's look at verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. There's one body. How many bodies are there? There's one body. And there's one Spirit. Even as you're called, the called out, the assembly of Jesus Christ, the church, Ye are called in one hope of your calling. There's one hope. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherein he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? 
He that descendeth is the same also that ascendeth up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. There was a purpose in what Christ did. It was not haphazard. It was pre-planned before the foundations of the world. That body that Jesus established is the church. It is the kingdom. And we can read about it in New Testament scripture. And we want to pick back up our discussion in um, Colossians chapter 1. And I don't really believe we're going to get there. Let's do this. We'll pick up and try to wrap this up by going to Colossians chapter 1 next week. Uh, we will just spend a little time here and then we'll try to get into the activities in the book. So please go ahead and prepare to do that. And um, we'll try to, to wrap this up starting next week. Appreciate you being here.